Thanks for having me here today. Uh, you know, each of us has, uh, what is it, like 100 billion brain cells or something, and, and trillions of synaptic connections between all those brain cells. Um, and so even one person is a huge amount of, you know, consciousness and uh, brain matter to deal with. So 14 is like a, a large group. I have to say some of the largest classes I taught were in Tokyo when I was teaching in Japan and those classes were over 60 people. So I've seen it all the way from one to <laughs> over 60. And uh, anyway, it's all good. So thanks for having me here today. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, how long do we have, Susan? Can you give me a time? Uh, as long as you need. As long as you need. Yeah. We are at Panera. They close at nine. Good. Well, great. So what I thought we would do today is we'll have a lecture about the history of remote viewing and related subjects. And then we'll take a short break. And then I have eight targets lined up to practice with that we can all try uh, right here using a kind of simplified viewing system. And um, and we wanna have time for questions too uh, during the lecture and afterwards with the viewing. So I'm good for, you know, a couple hours. I mean, if it gets too long, let me know, but there's a lot of information to share. It's very exciting times we're in right now. Uh, you would know this being part of the Cleveland uh, UFO group. And uh, I mean, I, I really feel like anything could happen with what's going on in Congress. I, I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be too cynical or skeptical about this because uh, I worked in uh, Vienna in 1989 at a research institute called the YASA, uh, in International Applied Systems Analysis, uh, International Association for Applied Systems Analysis. Okay, so this was a joint Soviet-American research institute set up by Brezhnev and Nixon in the early 70s to perhaps foster some area of, of cooperation between the Soviet Union and the US to reduce the threat of war during the Cold War period in the early 70s. And it was still going when I got there in 1989. It, it still exists now. Uh, it, was, you know, half of the, most of the countries there were Western European and US and, and there was Soviet Union and Soviet bloc countries. And I, you know, I remember all the Soviet and East German scientists there. This is only a few months before the Berlin Wall collapsed. And believe me, nobody saw it coming. Uh, nobody there that summer had any inkling that just a whole bunch of hundreds of East German tourists that were holed up in the West German embassy in Vienna could trigger a cascading effect whereby it would just ripple throughout the Eastern Bloc. And within five months, the Berlin Wall was down and gone and East Germany ceased to exist. And I still remember those East German scientists telling me how it wasn't so bad to live in East Germany if you were good with the Communist Party, you had good you know, childcare and healthcare and decent place to live. And so communism wasn't all that bad. And five months later, their society ceased to exist. So I'm just using that as an example before we start the lecture here of how quickly things can cascade when there's been corruption and repression of ideas, uh, important ideas in this case of what the truth is about UFOs, UAP, our contact with these types of intelligence and technology. And when I talk about this, I always get this type of cynical, skeptical attitude, like, you know, sure, nothing's going to change. But believe me, I've seen it change. I saw the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union in that summer of 1989 at Schloss Luxembourg in the south of Vienna. And so I know that within half a year, the walls can come tumbling down. Is it going to happen with uh, the UFO situation and all the evidence that you're all familiar with and anyone who's been looking into this knows goes back 70, 80 years. Is David Grush going to be the guy 
that triggers this uh, long overdue investigation by Congress? I don't know. But I mean, it could happen. Believe me, it, when it does happen, you won't see it coming. And uh, it can be like a chain of dominoes because that's the way it was in the East Bloc and leading to the collapse of the Soviet Union by 1991. So anyway, uh, let's proceed and then we'll have time for questions and then we'll do some RV. We'll do some actual RV. And uh, let me go ahead and share my presentation here with you. Uh, this is, hmm, desktop. One second, I do not see my ability to share. Uh, hold on, let me check my... Okay, we have screen record. There's a screen recording. You know, every time you update your operating system, I'm using the. I am using Apple here. Um, every time you update, you have to share. Uh, you have to check your privacy settings. Um, it's uh, an interesting facet of technology. Uh, let me go ahead. Okay. Uh, we've got this working now. One second. Thanks for your patience. Share. Okay. Can you all see that? Is that working? Yeah. Great. Okay. So what I want to do is give you a sense of how I got involved with this, how I think remote viewing, what I call resonant viewing, how I think this works. I want to show you a lot of examples so you can see just how accurate it can be. And um, uh, show you how concerned our government was with this, why they started the RV program. Before we begin, are most of you familiar with this concept of remote viewing? Is most most people? I mean, you're you've heard about this before. Yes. yes. Yeah. So I got involved with this uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I have a PhD in sociology. And uh, I used to teach statistics. I uh, I was open to the idea of new topics from science because I studied something called uh, fractal geometry. I mean, I looked at books like this and you know what fractals are. These are these kind of fractured looking shapes that have self-similarity. And from looking at the science of fractals and seeing how the shapes of nature really look like in graduate school, I was open to the idea that there might be topics that um, would be real that we didn't know very much about. It just set that possibility up because my graduate committee wasn't even very cool about the idea of looking at chaos theory or fractal geometry in the 90s. I mean, it, they were sort of relatively new topics. People knew about them in the hard sciences, but social sciences, there's kind of a lag, and they were not particularly keen on looking at nonlinear methodologies. But I did succeed in persisting. You know, getting a PhD is like an Olympics. You just have to persist, and it's like the triathlon or something. I mean, you're exhausted at the end, but you do it. So I was open to this idea that there was other things that I might not have been taught about. Um, and I had some slight interest in UFOs having had a sighting with my mom in the Everglades as a 12 year old or so. Uh, it, we did saw, saw something, we saw something that definitely, you know, it, it was even to this day, I can't describe what, I don't know what that was, but it was a structured object right overhead that was like full moon sized and round. And uh, my mom always thought that that was a UFO. 
there was a blackout afterwards. I had an interest since that age in uh, these topics. But once I got to college, like some of you, I was just a very focused student on what I was studying. So by the time I got into graduate school, uh, I I had didn't hear the word UFO mentioned, I don't think ever in from college to PhD. It's uh, 11 years, uh, you know, of uh, two years master's and four years and five for people. Yeah, so I hadn't heard about any of these topics. I hadn't heard about crop circles, even in the, the early 90s, uh, mid 90s. But remote viewing introduced me to all these topics. When I heard someone named Courtney Brown, who had was at Emory University, and he had an institute called the Farsight Institute, he was on my local uh, radio station, and um, in Boulder, Colorado, and he he studied chaos theory, and he said there was this thing called remote viewing that it was a declassified, formerly special access program that had been created by our CIA and DIA, uh, and that it was a set of protocols to allow you to have non-local perception, and that the U.S. was had used it to create psychic spies. And as you know, on the Ted Koppel show in 1995, the program was revealed, and it had been canceled earlier that year, uh, be, may, not because it didn't work, and we can talk about this later. It, it, it seems mainly if you talk to everyone involved, and I've been a lot to the, the IRVA conferences, International Remote Viewing Association Conference. Uh, this year, it's at the Monroe Institute in August, uh, in a few months, irva.org. Uh, that in, that organization didn't exist when I started studying this in 1996. But I really found that it did have, there were results there. The, the protocols had never been classified. Uh, it was controversial just because well, a lot of people are, you know, Congress people are they're always skeptical of new ideas and things. And the intelligence agencies liked it, but, you know, externally, it was the time of budget cutting. The program didn't survive officially past 95. Anyway, I took this class and it convinced me there was something going on to it. The results were better than I expected. And I wouldn't know because as a statistician, you would know what you would expect to get if you were just guessing. And this is the CRV protocol that I learned, controlled remote viewing. Um, it led me to be interested in crop circles. Uh, and I wrote the book, Opening Minds, A Journey of Extraordinary Encounters, Crop Circles and Resonance. I started to meet UFO witnesses at Farsight Institute, people that had worked with NASA, for NASA or NASA contractors that told me there was reality to the UFO phenomena with no doubt. And that led me to Black Swan Ghosts. And my most recent book is Dark Matter Monsters about my investigations into Bigfoot and ball lightning and coherent matter. So I've covered a lot of these topics because they're all uh, kind of connected, but it all started with remote viewing. Now, uh, how does RV work? Well, this is how I look at it. Uh, you know, we live in a physical reality. We have a, an experience of physical reality when we wake up every day. And that reality is based on certain fundamental physics constants and proportions. We all learned about pi in high school, uh, the ratio pi, 3.14159. But there's also phi. You've heard about this phi ratio. And the phi ratio is also called the golden section, the golden ratio. And uh, it is found throughout nature, throughout any biological system. We can see it in our own bodies. The ratio of the bones in our bodies are always at 1.6 to 1 to the next one. Throughout, Starting with the finger, going throughout your whole body, you find these ratios, and you find them in all sorts of living systems. And it means that our particular physical reality that you and I live in has a particular frequency and resonance to it around these fundamental constants that permeate our reality, like pi and phi and other really fundamental physics constants that physicists even to this day puzzle over something like the fine structure constant. Uh, why they are so precisely tuned. Um, but the phi ratio is a particular ratio that we see, uh, the golden ratio throughout our reality in many different forms. You see it here in this 
uh, mandala from the Hindus, uh, the Sri Yantra shape, you find this um, golden section ratio. Leonardo da Vinci uh, made it the basis of his famous uh, drawing the measure of man where he said that perfect human bodies were based on this phi ratio. You can see it here as the circle with the slash through it. And you can see this, you know, from the top of your eyebrows to the head to the rest of your chin is 1.6 to 1, or from your navel to your head to the feet. We have these particular uh, body proportions. And so we're built around this golden section, golden ratio. Buildings were built around this, like the Parthenon. And you can find books about the fire ratio. It's one of the uh, uh, fundamentals in physical reality. And anytime you have particular ratios that permeate a system, whether it's pi or phi or any other particular ratio, for us, it's phi you're going to have particular resonance and frequency there around uh, those particular shapes. Now, interestingly enough, when we build buildings nowadays, as you're all familiar, and, and many objects, technologi technological objects, we don't pay attention to the phi ratio as much. And this is why modern buildings, it could be the building you guys are in right now, don't have that sort of cozy feeling to them anymore the way buildings used to feel. Uh, people used to just intuitively build around the phi ratio. And ever since efficiency criteria took over, our, a little over 100 years ago with Frederick Winslow Taylor, the efficiency expert that became a consultant for many companies and organizations of how to become more efficient, the kind of phi ratio went out the window and things began to be built just around ordinary shapes. So rather than have the phi ratio, which has a fractal nature to it, it repeats. And fractal systems are systems that look the same uh, at any different scale, uh, kind of like your uh, bronchial structure or the way your heart, the windings in your heart, or even the rhythms of your heart. Rather than having that self-similar sort of nested a uh, doll within a doll sort of pattern, we have more efficient, uh, technically efficient structures that don't have those fractal properties and they don't feel the same. I think you can agree. For instance, in our inner ear, the cochlea is built around this golden section, golden ratio. Uh, you see it in the inner ear. If it didn't have these windings, um, you wouldn't be able to hear all the frequencies you can hear. Uh, and uh, you see it, as I mentioned, in the bronchial structure of uh, cell phones. Cell phone antennas in your cell phone are based on the same principle. It's antennas within antennas within antennas. And that's how you can receive all these different bands on your cell phone in you know a finite space because it has that sort of fractal pattern to it. Uh, another place where you find these patterns is in JPEG compression in images like we're probably using it right now on this Zoom call to compress data and not to have to share every single pixel, but just one out of 10 pixels and use a fractal algorithm based on these sort of proportions to reconstitute what something would look like. And we all know what JPEGs, I mean, they're pretty good representations, but they're not the best if you want to use it for book covers or serious design. You're going to need another format because JPEG is compressed, but it the files are a lot smaller. It's a fractal algorithm. So uh, we live in a reality which sort of has this uh, has this self similarity in particular ratios set up. Now another feature that seems relevant to the idea of remote viewing, uh, which I want to mention here, and it's something I've learned about more recently, is the concept of dark matter. Uh, the matter that we see around us is we're told by modern science, and obviously there's still debate about this, that we're only seeing uh, a small fraction of what's out there in reality, the physical matter that's out there. A lot of it 
uh, and this is known from the way the last hundred years, the way galaxies rotate and a whole bunch of other cosmological features that there's more matter out there than uh, we can physically detect. It, it doesn't interact with us electromagnetically. Um, and it doesn't interact with light because it doesn't interact electromagnetically. So it's called dark matter and no one knows exactly what it's made of. Um, but the galaxies would not exist in the structure that they have with the spiral arms, you know, like our galaxy, the Milky Way, unless there was this halo of dark matter uh, surrounding the uh, galaxy. But dark matter isn't just something that's way out there. Dark matter is actually all around us all the time because it's gravitationally lensed and focused. So anything that has mass attracts dark matter to it. So dark matter is something that permeates galaxies, but we also know it clusters around planets and solar systems and so forth. And the estimates are that uh, the majority of matter in the universe by a long shot is this dark matter. And as you've heard, the rest of it is something called dark energy, uh, is something even more hypothetical which would be 68% of what we see, uh, of what the universe is made of. And uh, so the visible universe uh, is only a few percent. And when you subtract matter that doesn't interact with light that's physical, but still is not illuminated, you're only left with about a half a percent. So basically when we look out there with what we can see with our instruments, we're only seeing a half a percent of what's there. Now, a small percentage of this dark matter is something called relic neutrinos. And these are neutrinos from the cosmic background radiation from the time of the Big Bang, just shortly after the Big Bang. You get this burst of neutrinos and you have to have these neutrinos for physics as we know it to hold together, the kind of standard cosmological model. Now, relic neutrinos fit the characteristics of dark matter, but only a small percentage of it. Only maybe a half a percent, one percent, no one knows exactly for sure of dark matter is these relic neutrinos, but that is still more than all the visible matter in the universe. Now, why do this, why does this matter? Well, this isn't just a hypothetical argument. I'm not presenting just, you know, vast theoretical ideas to you here. Uh, Relic neutrinos are gravitationally lensed. They are attracted to anything with mass and they are coming, we're in contact with them all the time. These are not like the solar neutrinos um, from the sun that you've heard about different experiments in remote locations on the earth in South Dakota and, and a place in Japan and Antarctica. They have these solar neutrino detectors. Solar neutrinos are very fast, super tiny and don't interact with anything. Uh, they go on forever, rarely interacting with matter. Uh, a billion are coming through your hand every second, we're told. Solar neutrinos. They're not dangerous. They don't even see you. They're that small. You don't exist to, to neutrinos from the sun. Uh, uh, that's an argument right there, while solid matter isn't really solid the way we think about it. Because to neutrinos, you're just like a ghost. And then they go right through you. They're small. But not true for relic neutrinos. Relic neutrinos... Uh, are a few microns big. They interact with cells. They interact uh, with chemical reactions. And um, they we know about them because experiments show that uh, their seasonality to radioactivity and biological growth and chemical reactions um, that... Uh, change based on time of year. And the only thing that could explain that is something cosmological. Uh, it's not a pattern based on day and night. So it's not solar industry. It's something coming from deeper in the cosmos. And you find this seasonality based on time of year, even in things like cold fusion experiments, there's a seasonality to it. So that suggests, and this is an image of a small charge cluster that you find in, uh, in cold fusion type of experiments. Um, and this will all make sense in a few minutes because what I'm building an argument for here is why RV is even possible at all. It's because we have this 
quantum entangled large set of particles throughout the cosmos that are at the far ends of time are on earth uh we're coming in contact not as many solar neutrinos that's like a billion in your hand a second or trillion throughout your body right now just sitting there uh relative neutrinos are a little different they can be blocked by the walls that you're in uh the roof would block them in the room you're in right now uh we know this because of certain experiments with uh, the types of micro ball lightning that we find in cold fusion experiments and so forth, uh, they can be affected by their position in the room relative to a window. Sometimes you have to open the windows again for the reaction to work properly, not for oxygen because you've used up all the relic neutrinos in that particular area. So this is something that we're coming in contact with, according to my research, about 10 million a second are touching your body. It would be fewer inside a room and more if you're outside. And these particular cold fusion experiments, uh, some researchers feel that this uh, uh, is made possible because of these relic neutrinos, because they enhance reactions. They're what we call bosonic, which means they encourage uh, chemical reactions to occur and particles to come together. Uh, more than they would if we didn't have these relic neutrinos. So they can be like a catalyst for reactions. We're in contact with them. Uh, this is actually, a lot of this comes out of the research of Alexander Parkamov in his book, Space Earth Human, that was translated by Bob Greener from Russian. And it's just absolutely fascinating book. Uh, Parkamov goes through all these examples of how he created this telescope with a slight radioactive element at the end and where he would point the telescope would affect the rate of radioactive beta decay uh, where a neutron pops out of the nucleus of an atom and decays into a, a proton and an electron. Um, he found there were seasonality and all sorts of really interesting aspects in this telescope he built himself with surplus Soviet equipment right around the end of the Soviet Union as we were mentioning before. Now interestingly enough Parkamov is also a top-notch cold fusion researcher who got the reaction going for 225 days. By the way, Google attempted to uh, uh, replicate his results recently, and they couldn't do it. But they were not doing it exactly the way he did it. I forgot the slight changes they made, but they made some changes which a lot of people thought it wouldn't work, and it didn't. So even a huge company like Google could not figure out something that this independent scientist, Alexander Parkinbaugh, was able to uh, reproduce. And he believed that relic neutrinos have a role to play in these cold fusion, low energy nuclear reactions. Now, here's the tie in to our topic today. Parkinbaugh was also part of the Soviet KGB remote viewing programs. Parkinbaugh uh, and others have said there were at least five KGB independent programs studying remote viewing, psychokinesis, and a whole variety of paranormal and psychic phenomena. He uh, worked with these government psychics, and this was the catalyst for our program in the United States, because in the, you know, probably sometime in the late 60s, early 70s, our government learned about these programs, as I'll show you in a second, and became very concerned that there was going to be a Sputnik moment, as Hal Putoff referred to it, uh, where they were going to leapfrog us in terms of psychic warfare, which would be a real concern to national security. Now, Parkamov didn't conclude that RV, the way he worked with the people he worked with, that it was consistent enough. But again, he's a physicist that's working with, you know, uh, telescopes and things like this uh, with low energy neutrinos, which is a, you know highly consistent and RV is highly variable. So I could understand why he would feel like he couldn't develop it any further. But I just find it interesting that the top scientists that came out of the Soviet Union, now Russia, were involved in their remote viewing program. Uh, our program was tiny compared to the Soviet RV program. And um, China also had a huge RV program. You can read about this in Paul Dong's book, China's Super Psychics. So this is part, a legacy of the Cold War. 
And all of these topics are seem to be intrinsically connected. I mean, we can explore this more in questions. I don't have the final answer how they are connected, but I think the fact that we are flooded with relic neutrinos all the time around us, a type of dark matter that can be detected with radio telescopes and interacts with cells and um, can affect us in interesting ways, provides a medium for communication. And this is, I'm just throwing this out there before we actually look at how it works, because I've always wondered, how is it that you connect with a distant target, you know, in, the, in another room or the next state over? I've done RV sessions with people, I'll show you one later, who were 500 miles away. And uh, it doesn't seem to be bounded by distance either. Even Edgar Mitchell talked about doing an RV experiment coming back from the moon. Uh in the uh, one of the Apollo missions, he was the sixth man to walk on the moon. I, I fortunately I got to talk to Edgar Mitchell a few times. Uh, he was at conferences, and he did an RV experiment in the Apollo capsule coming back to Earth. He was one of the people that was actually the catalyst for the program uh, initially because it was initially funded by NASA, and uh, Edgar Mitchell was there uh, with Russell Targ and a few people, and Werner von Braun, believe it or not. And they were at a conference and that's what, what the impetus was um, when Edgar Mitchell was interested in this and Werner von Braun said one of his grandmothers was psychic and Russell was interested and that's how they got, I think, Jim Fletcher to give them the seed funding for the remote viewing program, which lasted for 20 years. Uh, so fractals, uh, just briefly showing us here, I mean, they are important important even in things like ball lightning, which the Soviets determined, say a similar KGB classified study determined to have a fractal Maxwellian structure, not the ordinary Maxwellian fields that we're used to that go outwards and allow radio communications and everything electromagnetic. These are inwardly focused uh, electromagnetic potentials that have this sort of arrangement of rings within rings within rings. I wouldn't be surprised if you find a phi ratio in there somewhere because even Science Magazine uh, has uh, findings about phi ratios in exotic type of physics uh, experiments and so forth. So, and, and this would be a fractal type of shape where you get the same pattern repeating over and over. These Soviet researchers, uh, Zverbalis and Nevesky, uh, is verbalist stumbling upon one of these classified KGB experiments one day in Moscow, a higher, you know, worked with a mathematician and they concluded it was based on this ball lightning experiment that they saw where you would turn off the equipment and the orb would remain over the table for two days, up to two days after the equipment was removed, was based on a fractal structure. So it's just another example how this phi ratio uh, is relevant. Now, this was the first crop circle that I ever encountered. It's that Coke snowflake, as you can see here, that the, the Soviet experiments determined was the basis for ball lighting uh, and orbs and all sorts of interesting luminous phenomena, kind of a fractal uh, Maxwellian structure. They called them electromagnetic phantoms, for lack of a better word. This was actually the same shape that I saw in my first crop circle in 1997 in uh, the UK. It's also the shape that I studied in my PhD dissertation, just linking all this together. Uh, when I studied fractal geometry, this was the shape I looked at. Here it was in the field the size of a football, you know, 300 feet across, just huge. And uh, this pattern, you know, affected the cameras and batteries and so forth. I mean, I could even see in 1997 it had electromagnetic potential. How did I get involved with the crop circles? It happened because one of the targets that we viewed at the Farsight Institute back in 1996 were crop circles. I didn't know what they were in 1996, you know, but it was a target. What you can do with remote viewing is not just view ordinary sorts of targets where you know the outcome, but you can view sort of more esoteric targets for fun and just to see what you get. I mean, maybe you're right. And uh, I mean, they can these targets can be correct. You might discover something new. And that's why people use it with uh, medical processes and and different you know inventions to see if they can 
learn something differently than we know now. And I just got curious about crop circles, having seen my RV session where I looked through the pages that I had written in. I had all sorts of very interesting types of words there that I thought I couldn't really make sense of. But I thought if I went over to the UK, uh, I went with a guy named Ron Russell from the Denver area, whom I met at a UFO conference in Denver in 96. He was giving tours there. And I've been going over there ever since, even uh, taking over Ron's tours in 2006. Why? Kept seeing very interesting effects around crop circles. Uh, spontaneous remote viewing, people would get sort of precognitive um, information about things that hadn't showed up in the area, new crop circles that might show up in the next day or two. They would almost see them in their mind's eye. A camera, battery failure, orbs, uh, UFOs. Uh, again, sort of showing what we call overlapping phenomenology. And, you know, in our minds, and I'm like you, you sort of think, okay, remote viewing is one topic, right? And uh, and UFOs are another topic, and ball lightning is another, and, and Bigfoot and cryptids, that's like another topic. But they just overlap. Even the ball lightning researchers, I read these books about ball lightning from straightforward atmospheric scientists, and they even mention the word UFO in their chapters on ball lightning and say they can't explain why some of them appear to be intelligently controlled. It's some sort of overlap where we can't say exactly where the boundaries are. It's true with all of these topics too. So our crop circles is the way the pattern of the wheat, is it organizing dark matter, relic neutrinos into coherent uh, waves of matter and so forth. It's definitely one of the possibilities of why something just like this shape, uh, a fractal shape in a wheat field could uh, knock out your camera battery sometimes for months and other weird effects. Uh, is this related to what's been called chi energy? If any of you studied uh, Eastern esoteric arts or martial arts even, I came across this in college. This could be another reason why I got interested in these phenomena. I had a Tai Chi teacher in college, in Hampshire College in uh, Massachusetts, and uh, I always wondered whether this qi energy that you hear about from Chinese Taoist practices, was it a physical energy? Was it a philosophy? Well, the more I research it, it seems definitely related to all these topics now, uh, just because there's so much crossover with phenomena. And we know that people that are very good at Tai Chi and martial arts masters and so forth can project energy and knock a whole bunch of people over just by projecting qi energy affect cameras and electronics. Uh, you see this around cold fusion experiments, but you see it around people that have developed their chi field, their prana field, suggesting that this is all the same sort of energy we're dealing with, whether it's ball lightning or RV or psychokinesis or the effects of UFOs, orbs, Hestalin lights, and so forth. This is how I look at it now. Uh, you could disagree. I mean, I'm open to other points of view, but it just seems the more I study these topics, the more it seems that people that are really good at RV are also can do psychokinesis uh, and do other things as well. And uh, the reason we know about that is that Yuri Geller, the first test subject at uh, SRI in uh, the CIA funded program in the seventies at SRI, Stanford Research Institute at the time, when Yuri Geller was around, the first test subject, he was there for six weeks. Um, he People would see strange things around the lab, even small UFOs, uh, cryptids in their homes. Early uh, example of what's called hitchhiker effect. Um, just strange effects. Uh, A-ports. Again, there's something, believe me, coming out of academics, do you think that things can just materialize in front of your eyes? I wouldn't have believed it. But here you have Hal Putoff and Russell Tarr telling us, uh, read uh, the book Remote Viewers by Jim Schnabel goes over this. Eight ports showing up, things they had lost months ago showing up in an ice cream cone uh, that they bought on the beach. There's the lapel pin. Or it falls out of the sky while they're just walking around while Yuri was there. Again, Yuri was there for remote viewing testing, but he also could do PK and uh, other things. And it, it leads to these other phenomena that the researchers, even at Lawrence Livermore Labs nearby, I mean, they saw things they couldn't explain while Yuri Geller was around. 
So again, I mean, I'm not saying I have the final explanation to this, but it suggests some sort of uh, malleability to space-time where things begin to merge and come in from other perhaps parallel realities. It just opens up that discussion. Now, sidereal time is one link back to this idea of Parkamov and relative neutrinos. Uh, a long time ago, it was noticed that remote viewers would do better uh, some time parts of the day, not in terms of solar time, sidereal time. Sidereal time is the position of the Earth relative to the center of the Milky Way. And it was found that when the uh, Earth, your sidereal time at a certain time was pointed in towards the center of the Milky Way, the, the, the viewing results were not quite as good, suggesting that there's some sort of energy coming from the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, whatever energy it is. But that really relates back to Parkhamov's results with finding seasonable variation in neutrinos, relic neutrinos, and just ordinary biological reactions that he studied, uh, that you find a correlation in RV based on the time of day, you know, literally the position of the Earth relative to another cosmological uh, uh, aspect of reality being our Milky Way. You, you would, So if RV is a purely non-physical and i'm not going to say or tell you you have to believe what i'm saying this is the only reason it could work there may be other reasons it worked but to me the fact that the position of the earth relative to the milky way affects everyone's rv results and i've seen the graphs of it from ed may and others showing that this is true shows me there's a physical aspect to remote viewing uh that it, it's not purely a mental phenomenon if you know what i mean it's not when we think of psychic somehow we think of something uh, abstracted from physical reality. I think this sidereal time and uh, the results, you know, the viewing in uh, the results from relic neutrino experiments, dark matter, show us that there's a physical component to it, even if it's not entirely visible. So that's just interesting that there's a cosmological effect on something like RV. And this is the change in uh, accuracy based on sidereal time it's most accurate your viewing would be most accurate at 1300 hours and lowest at 1800 i don't know what time it is now if someone wanted to look it up what our sidereal time is right now uh, i generally don't pay attention to this when i'm training people and working with people in rv i mean i've been teaching it since 1996 and, you know, I don't just take out my sidereal time. I guess there would be an app, right? You could see what size there would be. It would be funny. If you could see, if you if the session really mattered, uh, maybe you would want to do it at 1300 sidereal time. But again, this is so similar to some of the ideas from dark matter physics that I think we need to pay attention to it. So how does it work? It suggests the idea that what we perceive of reality is just the tip of the iceberg. And this is just a student who was in my class quite a while ago, created this iceberg model, which I've always thought is pretty good, a kind of way to think about it, which is when we think we per are perceiving reality, you realize there are things happening around you right now, even in the room where you're in, that you could pay attention to, but you're not because you're paying attention uh, perhaps to my voice right now on the screen and so forth, right? But if you start uh, moving your attention around, it's it's a kind of a fluid thing. You could hear fans going, air conditioner sounds. You guys said you're in a uh, uh, restaurant, so you could hear other sounds going on. But normally we tune those out. The conscious mind and the unconscious mind work in a very concerted way to delete information that your unconscious mind says you don't need to see or hear. The information is there and your attention is something that you can have, uh, you can consciously affect your attention. And you're, you can make, uh, create the conditions where your conscious mind can access information from below the lemon. The lemon being this line you see going across the screen. Normally, we're not paying attention to individual cells in your body, right? The, the most subtle, perhaps, uh, awareness you would have of your body might be at the organ level. You might feel, if, you know, if 
you eat too rich at dinner, you might feel your liver a little bit or your organs, but even generally, we don't feel that very much. If everything's working right, you're not aware of any particular organs, but we know our body's made of organs and cells, and the cells are made of uh, chemical components, which are made of atomic materials, and the atomic materials are made of subatomic materials, which are made of even smaller particles like quarks and things and neutrinos, as we've mentioned. Finally, going down, we realize that matter is a sort of a is a wave. Uh, e equals mc squared. This is general relativity theory that matter and energy are interchangeable, and uh, this is really it matters to us still even to this day. All of these arguments that we see about the phenomena that we're all interested in, whether it's UFOs or cryptids or Bigfoot, which you have quite a bit of in your state or any anything that you're interested in this area, these types of phenomena. There's always this argument, whether it's physical or if it's quantum, but everything that's physical has a quantum aspect to it uh, because everything is based on frequency and wavelength. And that's what E equals MC squared plus the Planck constant tells us is that physical things have a frequency. And this is why you and I are able to communicate right now over Zoom because these frequencies are stable and that we can send and receive information across these frequencies. Well, normally your conscious mind does not want to be uh, overloaded. So you're deleting just about everything that your senses bring in that your conscious mind and unconscious think you don't need to see. And this is why you've all seen photos where there's a UFO in the photo, but no one remembers seeing it. Uh, the photographer didn't even consciously see it, but it was there when they snapped the photo. It's because uh, our brains are excellent deletion mechanisms. As Tony Robbins, the motivational speaker, he might have heard of, heard of, he was popular a number of decades ago, starting in the 90s. He called us deletion creatures. Th that technically turns out to be true. And there was a book that Ingo Swan, one of the creators of the CRV system, which we're going to look at in a second. Uh, Ingo Swan liked this book, and I, I discovered it just writing my dissertation. It's called The User Illusion by Tor Noratranders. This isn't about remote viewing. It's about brain physiology and how much we delete all the time. The idea that what we see around us is an illusion because it's it's a tiny fraction of what's around us. Nora Tranders argues in his book that we're only seeing 16 bits a second out of uh, 40 million bits that come into our awareness from our physical senses. Not even our subtle senses, which people like Ingo Swan in uh, you know, in books like this, like Reality Boxes, some of his books uh, argue that you know there are another set of senses beyond the physical. Even just the physical senses, you're only perceiving a tiny fraction of a percent, like just the tiniest fraction of one percent right now, consciously of what's around you. And this is why RV can work. Is however the information gets to us, whether it's through this unified field, whether it's through relic neutrinos, because they're all created at the same time uh, during the, the creation moment of the universe, the Big Bang, they're quantum entangled and they permeate the universe, whether it's from them or however it comes to us, the information is there in our sensory you know, apparatus. And we need some training to pay it to access it. And that's what remote viewing is. Um, it's not really remote, which is why I call it resonant viewing, because the information is coming to you now. Those relic neutrinos are pushing up against your skin 10 million a second. Or if it's coming you know, through quantum entanglement, I don't have the experimental data to say how it exactly gets to you. But think of it like this. We're all familiar with radios. Uh, even if we don't use them as much in our homes, we still have them in our cars and so forth. We're, I, we're familiar with the idea of frequencies of you're hearing a radio station, but you know there are other radio stations you could tune to. And that's sort of the same idea is normally you're tuned to conscious reality. What you've been told is real. And as Lou Elizondo has recently said in the UFO discussion that's going on right now in our country, uh, he says the reason, you know, this is being kind of really slowly is because what if the whole story of reality that you knew ever since you were a tiny little kid, the first things you understood from your parents, let's say that's all wrong. 
or at least incomplete, everything, all of it, including everything we learned from our parents, schools, religions, anywhere. It's just wrong. There's just more life out there that we weren't told about. The reason that matters is those belief systems that you have as a kid get hardwired into your brain. And Ellen Langer at Harvard did studies with kittens where she had kittens only in rooms with horizontal objects or horizontal lines or just vertical lines. And the kittens raised with either horizontal or vertical lines could no longer see other types of objects that weren't vertical or horizontal. They would bump into them. So uh, what it showed is that our brain gets hardwired by the time we're young adults around what we believe to be true. And this is why you're literally not going to see that UFO that's around you or those entities, uh, whatever sort of entities you're interested, whether it's cryptids or shadow people or whatever. I mean, these could be around you, but you literally wouldn't see them because uh, not just that they're made of another type of matter like dark matter, it, like I, I believe, but even if they're made of ordinary matter, your brain is so good at deleting things. I think you've all seen, just before we go on to see examples of sessions here, of that the inattentional blindness uh, experiments. Uh, it's a kind of a cumbersome word, but I saw this demonstration once. It, it's it's a movie. You can see it online. You know, two teams are playing basketball, white shirts and black shirts, and in the middle of, you're supposed to count how many times the white t-shirts pass a basketball. And in the middle of this, uh, a guy dressed in a gorilla suit walks across, beats his chest and leaves. And you don't see it because you're so focused on counting how many times the white team passes uh, the basketball. And the first time I saw the movie, I did not see the guy in the gorilla suit. I think about 85%, I think this was in New Mexico at a conference in Albuquerque. I think 85%, 90% of the audience didn't see it either. You're just not looking for it. Your brain deletes it. So if we're deleting things that are just uh, that, obviously there, how much are we deleting uh, that we haven't been told is real? Uh, your brain's very good at that. Well, the reason that matters to us doing RV is that it suggests that the information is there. And if you can tune your awareness to perceiving more subtle information below the limit, you're going to increase your non-local perceptive ability, your awareness. Now, this is something we all do anyway, because you've probably had experiences where you picked up the phone and you knew ahead of time who it was, or there was a family emergency and you had the feeling to call someone. I have a great example of this. Just two nights ago, I got a call from my mom rather late. She's on the East Coast. And uh, I was doing my uh, Bigfoot zoom group we get together every other week and talk about you know talk about these topics uh my mom had this feeling to check her bank account and found that her bank account had been hacked and someone had withdrawn a large amount of money from her chase account she never i asked her the next day uh she, she was able to call the bank that night a friend came over even before i finished my zoom group and uh, they were able to put a hold on the account um and uh, I asked her the next day, I said, do you ever check your bank account while you're watching TV? You know, she's 93. At 10 at night, your, her time. She said, never. It was just, um, it was just a uh, instinct. And it just happened. That was the day that some crook through perhaps the dark web. I talked to the bank. They don't know exactly how they do this. Not through the website somehow gets your account information and they all of a sudden they withdraw your account. You'll get the money back. Unfortunately, it takes up to three months and you have to fill out paper forms. Can you believe this? But anyway, that is an example of when there's a need for um, that remote perception. It seems to kick in. And I'm sure you've all experienced this with at times in your life. We can talk about this in Q&A. You know, just you had the feeling to call someone and there was something going on. Um, it even, I mean, it even goes farther. I mean, I've had friends who said they got calls from relatives who had already passed on. And they, it was a strange call for all of them. I'm just going to say hi. And they found they passed on. You've heard about that too. That's another subject. But I think it's based on resonance. And what resonance is, is this picture. is like tuning forks. Uh, 
you've all seen if you have two tuning forks that are at the same frequency or instruments, you hit one tuning fork, the other will spontaneously ring. I mean, this is resonance is the basis of electronics and uh, all of the electronics we use today, but today, but we all just know the example of tuning forks, right? It's the same sort of idea. If you're at that frequency of whatever that is, and we're tuned to the frequencies of our uh, you know, families and pets and so forth, we get this sort of uh, empathetic reaction when something happens to them, right? I mean, I think you've probably all experienced this, where you just have this feeling because you're at the same frequency with your family or partner or your pets or people you care about. You somehow just get this feeling to call or, and something where there was a reason to do it, just like my mom had the feeling to check her bank account. She's never late at night, just, just a little bit, a couple hours too late, but anyway. Um, so we talked about this, how we're only getting 16 bits out of 4 million a second. It's like our brain's a funnel. But the good news is we can reverse this narrow perception and go below the limit if you choose to. And you've chosen to by being in this little seminar today to see if you can expand your perception to perceive more than you're used to perceiving, right? If you could see the guy beating his chest as he walks across the camera, which again, 80, 90% of people miss. Now, before I show you a lot of examples of how RV looks like, how it works, and before we do some practice with it in, in a bit, this is a great movie if you haven't seen it, Third Eye Spies. Uh, it's uh, created by Lance Mungia, someone I know who's a good guy, and he's really interested in RV. And he and Russell Targ, one of the founders of RV at SRI with Hal Podoff and uh, Ingo Swan and Pat Price and others from that era created this movie. Russ said he wanted to do that before all these people passed away since uh, the, the program was in the 70s. It's 50 years ago now. And uh, this is a good movie. If you haven't seen it, Third Eye Spies, I can highly recommend it. I think it's the best movie about the history of RV in the U.S. and how it started and, and things we're talking about here. Ed May was someone I've talked to many times. He ran the program after Russell and Hal. Uh, from 85 to 95. He's the one who showed up on the Ted Koppel show. By the way, we have to give some credit to Ed. The night that they had uh, Gates on from the CIA in 1995, do you all remember that Ted Koppel episode? And they had Robert Gates on and he said, ah, Ed insisted on going and being on the show that night. And in those days, they didn't have Zoom or anything. You had to go to a local TV studio. They had to patch you in. And he, uh, his boss told him, uh, we're going to fire you if you go on the Ted Koppel show because this is a classified program or we're not, we don't want it, you know, we don't want to talk about it yet. And Ed went anyway and he got fired. He was working for SAIC at the time. And uh, he took, I mean, that's some guts, right? There are people out there that are going to do the right thing. He wanted to give the counter view to Robert Gates, who said, oh, this was never useful. We didn't use RV. That is hogwash. You talk to these people like Joe McMonagle or Lynn Buchanan or Paul Smith and other remote viewers. They task those guys every week. Different alphabet soup agencies were constantly using them and they got accurate results because I've heard about the ones that they we haven't heard about all the uh, projects they're working on. Some of them are still classified, but we've heard about enough. Uh, we know about the one where they found the missing Soviet plane in the uh, in the Congo, remember that, Ed, that Carter mentioned where the plane defected from Libya, the pilot, and they used the RV program to locate the plane. And in the entire continent of Africa, they were able to locate the plane and recover it, get the electronics from a Soviet plane because they wanted to get the electronics. Uh, so, I mean, we know it had tremendous successes. Well, Ed wanted to give the countervailing point of view, and he went on the Koppel show that night. If you look at it on uh, YouTube, you'll see him arguing against Gates, who said there was no value to it. Uh, it's just like a like Project Blue Book type stuff. Oh, there's nothing to this UFO stuff. It's all weather balloons, the same sort of argument there. So anyway, uh, Hal, uh, Ingo, and Russell at one of the IRVA meetings, which I was fortunate to go to many times, uh, Ingo, when they tested him, he st actually started out with a PK demonstration. Now, Ingo was an artist that lived in New York, and I lived in New York for a while until uh, around COVID time. I was partly in Boulder, and uh, my partner lived in lower Manhattan. So we got to visit Ingo. I got to visit Ingo once. We didn't, it was a little late. I, we always would bike around and say, can we RV his uh, building? And we got within a block. We RV'd it, and we said, 
we just feel Ingo is here. And we were only a block away. Finally, a friend of his gave me his phone number and I called Ingo and he called back and he said, come on over. And, and unfortunately, well, just the way where he passed on uh, seven days after I met him in 2013 in February, uh, late, late, I think it was late January. And uh, I, I didn't see him again. We were planning to have dinners. And he, he said, the next time you come back, I will tell you how RV works. <laughs> Go next time you come back. And we made a list, shopping list. for, And I, I didn't see him again after that. But he was the first experimental subject after Yuri Geller at SRI. He had sent, uh, according to Hal Putoff, uh, his experiment with these thermistors that he was published this experiment where he was able to affect the temperature of these little electronic components in a vacuum canister uh, remotely. And he sent that in and put off was intrigued. They were looking for psychics to experiment with. And they sent at SRI, he was able to affect a magnetometer. Hal has shown us the magnetometer results. This is not literally RV. Well, it was because they asked Ingo, can you put your attention on the magnetometer buried in the floor here that grad students at Stanford used for their uh, research. And Hal said every time Ingo focused on it, the needle would move, which should have been impossible because it's shielded for everything. Uh, I mean, literally everything because it's like a, it detects quarks and um, it has to be super sensitive, but Ingo could make it fluctuate. And that convinced him he could do something. So again, you can immediately see the relevance of PK to RV. Like it's a similar function, again, suggesting to me that there is a real uh, physical effect going on there. Pat Price was another person they worked with, Pat being a police commissioner from Burbank, California, who it said when he was police commissioner, he would send police officers to the scene of a crime before it happened. He would just get this sense there's going to be a crime at this area and he'd send squad cars out there. And the crime rate, we're told, was very low while he was police commissioner because he had a sixth sense. He saw their ad and he said, hey, guys, I think I can help you. And he, you know, just did amazing work. Uh, uh, Pat, there he is on the right. They brought him up in a plane once to see if it worked in the air. I mean, makes sense, right? And he was still able to view appropriately. Or I believe it was a rustle in the plane. They, they you know, did different experiments like this. One time they put Ingo and Hella Hammy down in a sub uh, out of, I believe, San Diego to test if it worked through water of course it did so this is just these are so let's look at some examples of this I mean, this is one of pat price's viewings of a soviet research facility the so-called peanuts facility you can look all this up later uh and see it for yourself but i mean he was able to reproduce this huge gantry crane that's his drawing on the right and that's an artist's drawing on the left they use drawings instead of photos from the keyhole satellites because just as we're hearing today in the UFO argument, they don't want to reveal the uh, accuracy of the sensors on, you know, uh, military uh, satellite systems and planes um, and the sensor systems that are used. If that's the reason for withholding some of these photos and so forth. Well, they didn't want to do it in the 70s either. So they used uh, artist drawings so that it didn't give away how accurate the satellites were. That's why we had drawn. And anyway. Pat was able to reproduce what this site looks like. And uh, he even in his mind, he he said, you know, I'm lying there. I see this huge gantry crane and then which you can see here. You can see the scale of a person in the drawing on the left. That's how small it is. So this is how accurate RV can be. He in his mind, he went in the buildings and saw these huge metal gores, according to the way that Russell Targ tells it. And uh he said it was being used in some sort of energy experiment. They were using it with chemical lasers. Uh, well, Pat died before they were able to get scientists and American scientists, but the American scientists verified these huge orange peel-like structures made of metal uh, that Pat had seen. So it shows us this is not feedback dependent. Even if you don't get your feedback, uh, you can get accurate results. Joe McMonagle, who, uh, I believe lives at the Monroe Institute now. You can take courses with him if he's still teaching. Uh, he's another, just another good example of a great viewer where, you know, look at the object on the left at the top and his drawing on the right. I mean, cred incredibly accurate. It can be that accurate. Uh, 
Joe was awarded, uh, I forgot which medal of honor. It's the high, he got the highest peacetime uh, award from the military for RV. Uh, and it said right on the award for, uh, you know, a certain number of sessions and a, a couple hundred accurate pieces of, I forget what they call it, EEs, uh, except uh, intelligence, you know, useful intelligence uh, items or something. I forgot what the term was, but they actually said they're giving it to him for remote viewing. So if anyone tells you, as I'm often confronted with it, it doesn't work, you know, if people got medals of honor for the highest honors you could get in our country during peacetime for RV. And it says it right on the plaque. He did these amazing viewings with the Japanese police to locate missing people. And I forgot what the exact number, and it was on this show, the Jimmy Sakota show in Japan, they would have him on. And uh, I've seen some of these, but they were in Japanese, even though I've been there, I, I couldn't understand exactly what they were saying, but it was, they would just give him the name of a person. And he said, even just from Virginia, uh, with no other information, he was able to kind of look down on Japan from above and move down it, break it down, break it down, end up with the right block apartment and apartment number. He would give the police the apartment number purely from remote viewing. I think he was able to locate, you know, something like 13, 14 out of 18 cases, pretty amazing. People who had had accidents and, and other ways people disappear, he was able to find them again and reunite them with their families, purely using RV. And here's sort of what it looks like in some of the SRI experiments. You can see this scene from Switzerland on the left and what he was able to draw on the right of just very accurate renditions of a scene. Uh, you know, you could, you could look at this picture if you went there, it would look exactly like what he drew pretty much. Uh, he was able to identify this new type of Soviet submarine, again, because these experiments are done in the seventies when the Soviet Union was still there. And this one was different because the, the missile launch tubes were ahead of the conning tower as we're told. And uh, no one believed it because all the people in the defense department said, well, you can't make a sub that way. They're all the missile tubes are not ahead of the conning tower. They, they, there was a huge building uh, by near the sea somewhere. And they just didn't, they thought it was an aircraft carrier being built, but Joe said, no, it's a sub. And that's, that's what he drew at the top. And when it finally came out of the dot onto the docks, I mean, and went to see this is, it looked like his drawing. So this is, uh, uh, I think he said recently that when someone asked Congress about it, or he he said, well, what about this session I did? Someone said, you just were lucky, right? Yeah. Uh, he did some sessions at SRI. Look at the, this is of uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs. This was so-called outbounder experiment. What this is, early days of RV, before you had the system that we're going to, I'm going to show you shortly, with that's written. They would send a person, they could have been Russ, Stard, or Hal, on out to 10, one of 10 random locations. They would draw it out of an envelope. This is like pre-computer. And the outbounder person would go to that place, and the viewer would be back in the lab in their Faraday cage room, locked in the room, and describe where this person was. And so they had Joe do this, and the target that day happened to be Lawrence Livermore Labs, and that's where the person was. And look at uh, the session is just incredibly. I look at the building, and he's his drawing on the left, and what the building looked like, and it, it continues even to the tree line in the back, all that road. It was just this is the sort of thing that you know you look at, and if you were in the U.S. government at the time, you would be concerned. And this is what you see from the documentation from all the different uh, intelligence agencies these are still to this day some of them are redacted but what you see in these documents and we're seeing a lot of these recently uh, i don't know if you follow john greenwald's the black vault channel or, or any of these you know where we're looking at the documents and it's like mostly redacted a lot of the time even i was amazed the other day look, listening to john greenwald's channel and he's he got the UAP uh, book for describing UAP phenomena from the Defense Department. There's actually a UAP UFO booklet that is what you're allowed to talk about in front of Congress and what you're not allowed to talk about. Something like that. 
and half of it was redacted. In other words, you can talk about the fact that UAP and UFOs are of interest to Congress, uh, that there's programs within the Pentagon, Arrow, and all the offices, but there are things you can't talk about, but those were redacted. Uh, I imagine that includes uh, details about crash wreckage, how it works, alien bodies. Your guess is as good as mine, but that was amazing, even in her book of, about how to talk about UAP, what you can talk about, there is uh, redacted sections. Well, it happened in the RV program too, since it was a special access program. And if you look at all of it, look, they're, they're concerned about, this is before our program exists. These are all declassified. And Russell Tard, by the way, his son, who is an attorney, got these declassified a lot of these for the Third Eye Spice movie. That's why it was such an accomplishment. The movie alone, uh, they got thousands of pages declassified. Uh, so when you look at these, there's a talks about threats. Uh, you and I are interested in these subjects, RV and UFOs and psychokinesis and space-time distortions and orbs. But the way the government looks at it, you know, it's a threat. <laughs> it's a threat to COMSEC, which is communication security, OPSEC, operational, you know, security sources and methods. And, and you see this throughout the documents that have been declassified. Um, some of the successes of the program where remote viewers had successes. We could see it right here. They had some successes. And then you find references to Chinese research. Um, and if you look at the Chinese remote viewing, I mean, folks, it's, pr it's pretty good if it's what it seems to be. The, uh, the top would be um, the target. And I believe uh, the bottom is what the viewer perceived. Yeah, sent and received. It says one and two. Some of it's pretty close to what Pat Price could do, which was to read documents in a folder as he did at the uh, NSA facility in West Virginia when the target was supposed to be someone's vacation cottage, but he ended up seeing all of these. A, a secret installation, which was very close to this vacation cottage in West Virginia. And he, he said, I'm just... He smushed his mind into a file cabinet and read all these words off. And it, it was a special access program for uh, monitoring a Soviet satellite that came over every night at the same time. And that's what this particular project was, a, a Soviet satellite that sucked up electromagnetic information from the U.S. And Pat could read words off of a page. Well, these Chinese viewers can do this, too. You can see this. So you could see if you're in the Pentagon, you would. Uh, you would, might be concerned that they could do what Pat could do, but in a hostile way. Um, so, yeah. And again, it's just, you just see the word threat, ESP, uh, extrasensory perception, and all of the potential threats. A PK as a threat. Defense against ESP. So this is sort of why these sort of subjects we don't know as much about them, I think, as we should, including UFOs, is because as long as the you know defense and intelligence community feel that it's a threat to COMSAC or any other aspects of their operations, they are not going to allow materials to enter the public domain so we can talk about it. So all of this stuff had to be declassified years later from NSA and CIA documents. And, and they just go through all aspects of the phenomena, remote viewing, telepathy, precognition, you can see this in the middle there. Defensive blocking, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it makes you think of slide nine. Remember slide nine from Chris Mellon where they had all the potential threats of uh, UFO and UFO technology, of, you know, penetration of solid services and mental effects and so forth. This is very similar, it reminds me of that. So you kind of get the idea. And this is why they started the program because they had done their own, you know, investigation. So I started teaching this, you know, 96 at Farside. I, as I mentioned, I started teaching in Boulder in 97. And um, uh, I taught in Japan. So this is the written method. It, it starts generally with random numbers. And it, the outbounder did not have random numbers. They would just say, how is that a location somewhere around Menlo Park or Palo Alto or San Francisco, wherever they were at the time, uh, describe Hal's location. 
Uh, but later on, Ingo said, came up with this idea. And, and, and he got this idea partly from, apparently from Jacques Vallet, who visited at SRI and said, why don't you like make it like addressable coordinates within a computer, like memory addressable coordinates. And Ingo said the idea of coordinates just kind of came to him one day. <clears throat> well, they didn't want to do it. They couldn't imagine. They had been using maps. I mean, just like Ingo, tell us what part of the map we're looking at. And, uh, you know, we have a page of a map and they had a huge map. But uh, once Ingo proposed coordinates, they weren't they didn't think it would work. The coordinates are uh, like uh, this type of target. Like you write random numbers on a on a target and then you name what the target is and you have the random numbers and you read the random numbers to the viewer. That's all they get. In theory, it helps them locate what the target is and then they can connect with it. So the conscious mind doesn't know what you're looking at. And so you have this ideogram, which is like uh, just a short hand motion from uh, your nervous system, autonomic nervous system. And then you get colors and sensories and dimensions. The aperture opens up. That's how the theory is in CRV. And eventually you can draw and uh, get more uh, specific information. So even beginners in my class I was always amazed that they could do sessions like this where, you know, it's a laptop screen from the nineties and the viewer is able to a double blind target, by the way, I didn't, I didn't know what the target was. It was a hidden in a folder without me knowing what it was. They're able to reproduce the picture. It could have been anything you could imagine that's in a photo that you could put in a folder and here they get it. Or like this session from Japan look at that sort of triangular shape in the photo on the left and what they're able to the viewers able to get so every time i see it, it i am still amazed that it can be so accurate with the viewer only being given these random coordinates there's no information in random numbers you can a lot of ways to generate random numbers there's no information there but they're able to connect to the target and uh describe it very accurately um and you basically, you don't tell the viewer what to do. The viewer is on their own. A monitor, like someone in my position, is just encouraging them to describe whatever they're perceiving. The only rule in CRV is um, you cannot edit anything out. Remember how we said in the beginning of this talk that the brain is a, is a huge deletion machine. And it has to, because how much information can you absorb every day? especially nowadays with all the media we're exposed to, you have to forget about a lot of it because what matters is what's right in front of you. And you, you know, there are hungry mouths to feed in your family and your pets and places to drive to safely. You can't be focused on everything that comes in. But um, in CRV, while you're doing a session and you're at your desk, it's a written system. The rule is do not edit anything out. Anything that comes across the transom, you have to write down somewhere. That's why it works. You're not editing anymore. So it works even at a large scale. Here is the ga that canyon in Mars, and this is what the viewer got. I mean, they just drew this big round shape and this big kind of gash across it. You know, it, this is like a little five, 10 minute session and look how accurate it can be. This is the moon. And look, they kind of get the circles and that sort of shape, whatever these seas are called on the moon. This was the target, and this is what the viewer is able to get. Uh, correct direction and uh, color, silver, blue. <clears throat> this one is interesting. I mean, the target, this is the target, the Washington Monument. And uh, the viewer has just drawn their ideogram. And uh, the ideogram is basically just to get a feel of is it natural or man-made? Just the most basic description without thinking, you know, is it motion? Is it water? Just something very basic. But this viewer immediately latched on to the target, the Washington Monument. But they got there so quickly. And he even writes A dash, which is the noise, AOL column. It's where you let things go. Remember, you can't edit anything out, but if you feel like it's noise, like it's just your mind making something up, you put it off to the right side of the page as a AOL, A dash. And he says, George Washington Monument. I mean, he was there so quickly that he couldn't imagine why it could uh, be this accurate. 
So in his mind, he walked down the reflecting pool uh, there near the White House to the Lincoln Memorial. And he described the Lincoln Memorial. And that's on the flip side of this page, which you can't see, but he drew the Lincoln Memorial. And that's where he thought the target was. But he was uh, correct from the beginning, even three minutes into the session. And uh, that is one of the features of RV is that it can astound you with what you're getting so that you start doubting yourself because your conscious mind isn't doing it. Your conscious mind is just acting as a secretary to write the information down, letting your unconscious mind or your subconscious, whatever you'd like to call it, um, access the information. So it can hit you so quickly that you just can't imagine why it could be that accurate. And this happened in this session too. This is a race car, uh, one of Ron Russell's sessions. And here's a race car. Same thing. He said, I, I don't think it could be a race car. So he ended up describing a stadium, a race car in a stadium, which is exactly what it is. Now, not every single session always looks like this. Even Joe McMonagle, he he's told us, I don't know if it's true, he says he misses 50% of his sessions. The 50% he gets are right on. The other 50% are total misses. Because we're human. It's not like we're, we're remote viewing machines, you know. But if you want to do this and you sit down and quiet your mind, you do seem to be able to describe what's in the folder and visit the location. I mean, not just describe what's in the folder, but go there and walk around the site. So this is, uh, you know, White House with the fountain and there's, he writes fountain, kind of White House, majestic building and all this. <clears throat> One of the Saturn launches. Hmm. So it works at different scales. Now, this is what shows to me that you're not just viewing the piece of paper in the folder. The easiest way to train people is to take different pictures, you know, and people like me that teach RV, we collect magazines uh, and cut out pictures on them and say good ones, real pictures of real things for later classes. And uh, you never, you know, never throw a magazine away without checking out if they're a good, good target there. And so I work a lot with, you know, photographs of that are pasted onto a piece of paper. And nowadays, more often, you could kind of have the numbers associated with something in your computer. It seems to work just as well. But in this case, this was a paper target in a folder, Leaning Tower of Pisa. The viewer comes in from the side, not from the front, the way the target is. And I had to look up online whether there were mountains, hills behind the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And there are. It looks like this, something similar. So, this shows us that the viewer is not just somehow reading Simeon's mind or whoever is in charge of the session. Um, and just describing like accessing my mind to see what I've seen in the photo. They're seeing it from their own point of view, right? And moving around the target site, which shows us they're actually there. Um, so it's just fascinating. Here's uh, Marilyn Monroe. So. This was the photo, and this is sort of a stylized, it looks sort of like Marilyn Monroe sort of leaning back towards you, looking back to you. I mean, sometimes RV sessions can be funny because the unconscious mind has a sense of humor, and it can present them a kind of like an Andy Warhol-type artistic drawing of something. Uh, I've seen this many times where the target was something and the viewer drew something related to it in a funny way. They didn't know they were doing it at the time. It's a blind target, but any case. So uh, any questions so far in any of this uh, before we actually go into the instruction section of our talk today? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, mm -hmm. you know, just to show you a couple books, I would encourage you, uh, <laughs> don't take my word for it. Just do your own reading. There's lots of books on the subject. This is Miracles of Mind by Targ and Katra. That was a good one. This book about China's super psychics by Dong and Raphael, that's a good one. Okay. And even Bevy Yeager's had some books. She was a self-trained person, not a natural psychic who worked with the police. You probably show, saw her on all those police shows in the 80s when they had a group of psychics helping them out sometimes. Uh, so uh, I, I would suggest you, uh, this is a big subject, but... Um, in any case, let's uh, continue on. Actually, there's a little more I want to show you before we get to the viewing. Is that okay to continue? Yeah, okay. 
So this. The, what's that? I said something to be quiet. Okay, so so before we go on, let me tell you one story that shows you how incredibly uh, repressed this information is. Uh, and this is in my book. I put this story in because I got permission to put it in in my uh, my newest book, uh, Dark Dark Matter Monsters about Bigfoot and cryptids and ball lightning and some of these phenomena, how they're overlap. Uh, this was from a former Secretary of Defense uh, who was a temporary Secretary of Defense um, while the person had to other the person they appointed had to go through their security clearances and get approved by Congress. And he said that he was in a room with 30 other intelligence analysts and officers listening to a Soviet PK experiment in 1976. He gave me permission to share this story. It should have been shared with, you know, the whole country. But he said they heard while listening in, spying on this experiment, a Soviet PK sender bend a spoon from a thousand miles away from Moscow and the spoon bent. And he, when I asked him how come, you know, this wouldn't have been like a news, you know, uh, event, something that you could have in the news the next day, you know, US government has proof uh, positive of uh, PK and remote viewing or something like this. Uh, he said it came down to everything you saw in those redacted documents I showed earlier, some of them, you know, that it had to do with, uh, sources and methods and security and that overweighed and i think it's been doing this for decades in our country it overweighed it out uh outweighed the benefit of telling the public that pk is real that they had observed the russians doing it from a thousand miles away they never told anyone he said you're the 31st person to hear about it I said, I've never talked about it before. And none of those other guys in the room did. So now you're the 31st person to know about. I, I didn't mm -hmm. even tell the remote viewing program, which is Fort Meade. Can you believe it? So this is how real this stuff is. But no, we just don't have a national conversation because the information is hasn't been released. And they don't quite see the value of uh, uh, to our, our intelligence, our minds, our growth as people to realize that these phenomena are real and that we possess these abilities. So in any case, uh, let's take a look at the protocol. Then I want to show you some advanced sessions and then we'll do some practice, okay? Uh, we use a written system and this is based on the Ingo controlled remote viewing system that Ingo was basically hired to create. It's a written system. Not all the systems are written, I, as I mentioned before, this has phases, but the other systems were basically close your eyes and describe to a tape recorder what you're perceiving at the outbounder site. That was how it started, tape recorder. And then uh, Ingo came up with the idea of coordinates. And initially they used longitude and latitude uh, when they started with coordinates. Um, and they had to get bigger and bigger atlases, according to Russell, because the viewers are so accurate, they had to get the biggest atlas they could from the neighboring bookstore to verify that, you know, they would give Ingo or other viewers longitude and latitude. And the viewer would say, I see this, I see that. And it worked. But then the criticism was maybe these people had memorized the map. They had eidetic memory that they just were, you know, the type of people. And there are people like this uh, who can memorize large groups of numbers and things. And maybe they had just, or memorizing longitude and latitude and sort of identifying the target that way. So they changed to random numbers. And that's what we use nowadays. So it starts out with phase one, where you just describe uh, a line that you draw that we call an ideogram. It's Ingo's contribution to RV because they noticed that psychics were move their hands around. So they just put a pen and, and write. And then we go to phase two, which as the aperture opens up of your perception, because it starts slowly, because your conscious mind has to relax and stop editing, as we talked about, go below the limit, subliminal. You start getting sensory information of the target site. And then after a little while goes by, the viewer will start feeling the, the 3D 
dimensionality of the target site in, in their imagination. And they'll get a feeling of what it's like to be in the target site. And then they'll draw a phase three drawing of the target. And then there's other phases, but they could describe in a summary what they got. And that's sort of the basis of this written controlled remote viewing system. Uh, it's a successor to these other non-written or purely verbal systems that are called extended remote viewing, ERV. Now, I'm not saying this is better than ERV. Uh, people like Joe McMonagle don't like CRV. They don't want a written system like this. They just want to visually go there in their minds. I, and that's what he teaches at Monroe. I'm just telling you about this system because that's what I learned. I think they both work. It just is all a matter of preference. You have to be kind of foolish to do this. Remember, the rule is not to edit while you're doing your session. Easier said than done. We're all really good at editing out what's normal. We have to sometimes. You know, you can't just be impulsive and do everything you think of. So we're very good at editing. But during RV, you have to write it down somewhere. Now, why this may work, I mean, there's always the idea to me also that these realities exist because even if we look at it from a point of view of resonance and relic neutrinos, how are you viewing the future? It's been shown to be accurate viewing the future. There's a famous case where they had a viewer follow a known uh, American spy, uh, you know, spy working for the Soviets somewhere in DC. And they wanted to find out the next time he was going to meet with his KGB handler in DC. And so they had the viewer go to the future and read the newspaper that the KGB agent was reading, sitting in the park waiting for this American to show up. Or it was the American reading the newspaper, one of them. And it was accurate. I mean, they went to the next the next meeting, they went there on that date and they caught these guys before they were able to commit more espionage. So it works in the future. So this suggests the idea of parallel realities also. You know, that the future is happening now. That And this is another aspect of it, that it's not so much that time is a line linear, even though it seems that way to our minds. It's that things are happening simultaneously and our minds are good at can, turning reality into a string, right? Uh, it, uh, consciously into a feeling of past, present, and future. But maybe it doesn't work that way if you can uh, view the future accurately, which has been shown to be true also with these ARV experiments associated with remote viewing where people view the stock market or commodities, anything with a binary outcome, up or down. It's been shown to do that. Both Hal Putoff and Russell Targ ran their own ARV experiments and made a lot of money. And so did Greg Kalachitik from Canada, uh, endurance athlete, did his own solo experiments for 13 years. He published it in a journal. Uh, if you're interested, I can give you the website. And he got 65, 70% accurate traits just from using little mini sessions and identifying market up or market down, which won't happen until later in the week. So and that's what John von Neumann suggested, that there's something called psychophysical parallelism, that states of mind have a physical reality to them too, which suggests parallel realities and multiverses. Just going to throw that in there as one possible way that people are able to not just view things happening now or in the past, but in the future and do so accurately. So I wanted also to show you some of these advanced targets. This was the first crop circle I ever encountered. It was in the U.S. as a remote viewing target. The Triple Julia set at Windmill Hill from 96. I mean, and this is my first crop circle drawing. I mean, there, it's a circle, yeah, and information going in and out, something going in and out of the circle, the hills behind. You know, so it's just interesting. This is my first contact with a crop circle is through resonant viewing, remote viewing. So this is how I got curious in it. Um, it's very interesting. This viewer, they were able to get these cross-hatching tram lines. Mm -hmm. Even though they didn't know what they were viewing, they were able to describe that pattern very well. Um, so we can use viewing for non-ordinary 
targets, like orbs, like this particular target. This someone saw this with their eye, looking towards Woodboro Hill, where I actually have I happened to be at the time when he took this photo with a group uh, doing a meditation. And this German tourist was coming to meet us, and he took this photo of this orb over a crop circle. And this is the type of thing that you can view. You put it in a target in a folder, right? You circle it. And you write this out and the viewer views it. And you sort of see what they get, you know. It's not as verifiable as the targets I showed you earlier uh, because no matter what they get, energy detected and things spreading out, natural processes and uh, uh, just interesting energy transfers, interesting information, we can't verify it completely. Um ball lightning and orbs are ephemeral they disappear it's hard to know exactly but this can be a lot of fun to do and expand your ability to see things differently and so on. and this is a good post session summary on that here's like the orb like it generating some sort of energy field in front of it you know you can take pictures of ufos uh this is that one from 97 over mexico city and you know, we just you give it to the viewer, put it in the folder and see what they get. Uh, it's all just part of the fun. I mean, you can verify the shape of it. Sometimes they go inside. It's pretty good drawing. I mean, look at that apartment building in the uh, You They can go inside and then you ask them what they're perceiving. Sometimes people have said they feel like there are intelligent beings inside that can perceive them and they want to stop the session. Like they're being re retro viewed. Uh, back at them. But it, it's interesting to get these drawings, the, just like the target, flying, flight, I think. Right on target. Is this what the chairs look like inside? I don't know. <laughs> this is what one of the viewers got. We can't go inside, you and me. Uh, reminds me of a chair that envelops you. Space Age chair. Phoenix lights. We've done those. Just interesting to see what you get. Again, we can't totally verify all of it, but it's, you can get good drawings and stuff. And it's very interesting results that are sometimes a little hard to decipher. Uh, Roger Lear, the uh, pediatrician that um, studied implants, did the implant removal Remember Roger Lear. You know, at one of the conferences, he's passed on now. Uh, he passed on in 2013, right after the citizen hearing. I, I used to talk to Roger a lot, and he wanted us to view the rocket dying facility in Simi Valley. So we did. I mean, blind. I just gave the viewer the, the coordinates, as you see here. This is their drawings, and then they feel like uh, there's something underground, underneath. I did a sliding exercise. I just I can move down, and let's see what you get. Uh, controlled from above. Roger was interested whether there was a, you know, some black budget program operating underneath the Rocketdyne facility. And the viewer did get this tunnels going down and things. So, you know, and I came back to Roger. I said, yeah, that's what we got. Here's the picture. Isn't that kind of cool? Like a whole facility underground. Uh, well, we can't go there, you and me, but you just wonder, well, you know they were accurate with 3D regular targets. Um, is this an accurate session? Idea of it being covert and secretive. So I would, I would say yes. I've seen examples. I'll show you some right here where you, they just nail it. Uh, free energy machines we got is based on phi ratios and these kind of sothic triangles and so forth, which actually. Uh, is what you seem to get in some of these cold fusion experiments. You get these shapes like this. You get these little charge clusters, so-called exotic vacuum objects. Uh, this, this sort of thing was studied by Ken Shoulders, who was also at SRI before the RV program. You had Ken Shoulders. And this is a whole nother lecturer who was active in the area of cold fusion and uh, ball lightning and charge clusters and so forth. And so these sort of look a little bit like what Ken talks about. Um, now this, this one was really interesting. Uh, this one, this is the hangars at Area 51 at Groom Lake. They test, you know, America's adversaries planes out there. In this case, these are MiGs. Now this viewer, I just called him on the phone and all I said is, uh, Terry, I have a target for you. 
are you interested? And she said, yes. And I said, here are the coordinates. And I hung up. That's the entire conversation. And this is what she was able to get uh, 500 miles away. The hangars and the planes towards the top of the page. She actually ran out of room. And this is why she went over the, the holes in the page. But she got those big hangar doors. You can see them right there. And this is literally how accurate it could be. I mean, she got the plane, she got the doors, and she was able to walk inside the hangars and see what was there. Um, she felt like there were UFO-like vehicles inside, deeper into the hangars. Uh, I, I don't know if that's true because we are not there, but anyway, that's how accurate it can be, even with these esoteric targets. So... Um, Let's see. Uh, Pair Labs, just quickly before we do our practice. Uh, Pair Labs was at Princeton, Princeton Anom Anomalies Engineering Labs. They did RV, but they also did PK, micro PK. They found that you and I could affect a random number generator. And these are the results. When you tried to make it go higher, more ones than zeros, you would get over, you know, like 100 trials it would deviate from randomness. The green line is randomness. It would go high or low. If you tried to make it go to zero, more zeros from the random number generator, it, it would go more zeros. It just the average person could do this. And especially bonded pairs, couples could influence the machine more than people on their own. Um, and to the event of two to three events per 10,000, which is highly significant given that the thing is spitting out, you know, uh, 10,000 events a second. So, sorry. And then odds of 375 trillion to one that this is by chance. So you're getting a real result there, PK. I saw examples of this in Japan at a place called the Magic Parlor, where there was a fellow that you would have lunch, his wife would make lunch, and then he would do these amazing PK experiments. He would bend glass with his hands uh, without heat. Uh, he could... Uh, reproduce drawings that you had made earlier in the day. Uh, I'm told Sony, the head of Sony, went there and they filmed this with the best cameras they had and they couldn't detect any trickery or forgery or magic tricks. Ben Spoons, uh, he could affect your watch time. I saw him do this in front of my eyes. This is the watch. He could make the hands move around. Uh, I, I got to meet him after the uh, demonstration. I got to see him twice over the five times I visited Japan. He could make the hands move without touching the dial. I saw it with my own eyes. He would just just cup his hands over. He warned me it could break. And then the, the, the hands had been moved. So uh, he ran his hand over my arm. He said, Do you want to? And it was like, it felt like what Nikola Tesla described in his experiments as a prickly, stinging feeling. Uh, what is that? I think it's these uh, relic neutrino charge clusters. When you emit the same wavelength neutrino, uh, it's called a cold neutrino. I think it's the same charge clusters. And Tesla, when he was in front of his machines, would talk about that stinging feeling. The human body can emit that. That's It's just incredible that we have this ability and we have such little literacy about it, right? Isn't that incredible? But yeah, no, I, I could feel it. He, he said he worked at the local hospital healing people, but I, I remember that stinging feeling. I mean, it was real. It's deep in the arm. It's real charges going in there, being emitted by someone's palm, uh, kind of like a human electric eel or something like that, but through, you know, at a distance. Uh, and um, the most amazing thing that I saw him do uh, was he was levitating light, small objects like a yen note a paper currency, the yen. He, uh, and then he levitated a cigarette. And the cigarette's above his hand. And I'm thinking, oh, there's gotta be a, I mean, you know, I'm skeptical. I'm thinking there's gotta be a string or something, you know? I mean, I'm 15 feet back from the, the, the counter is doing this. And it, it's almost like you could read my mind because he looked at me and the cigarette went shooting in my direction and went into my shirt pocket in the air. It made a right angle turn around here and went into the shirt pocket with force and he's still standing over there. And I still have the cigarette somewhere here. Uh, no string, no, no magnets, it's real deal, real PK. So we all have this ability. The question is to train it a little bit with some direction, some instruction to develop it. I, I believe that we should just develop it as 
the way you want to comfortably. You don't have to be a, like Ingo Swan or Pat Price. We're all very busy people. Our minds are focused on many things. Uh, but it is fun to see that you can do this. This is the main reason I, I train people. It's be purely because it's so much fun to see that you have these abilities that you didn't, maybe you didn't know you had. And that space time is maybe hooked together in ways that you didn't know. And that things can happen that didn't seem possible, but they happen right in front of your eyes. And it opens up your perception to other things. And to me, it opened up my mind more to UFOs and phenomena around that, crop circles, orbs, and so forth. It was like a, you know, like a gateway, like the, the Monroe Institute, like a, they call it the gateway course. It's like a gateway to a broader reality. So this is why we do this training, in my view. Uh, that's the value of it, to show you that you have abilities and capacities that you're not aware of. It isn't to win the stock market all the time or just to be pra you know, practical uses of it. I'm not against that, but I think for the average person, it's just to show yourself that even what we're, and we're going to do some right now, uh, even just sitting here with a short amount of instruction for five the next five minutes, you will be able to get some results. Let's see in these targets I've prepared for you. So, and we'll have some questions after this. This is the shortened protocol that I developed. It's really short from the CRV system. And this is what we're going to do right now. I just called it Uniview. You cool down, take a few minutes to settle your mind down, take a few deep breaths. You know, in reality, if you're doing a target that really matters, you might want to take 20, 15, 20 minutes to cool down. But, you know, here you just take a few breaths, exhale, relax. Let your hand move on the page once we start doing the session. And um, draw an ideogram, just, it's just a little squiggle. And then touch it. This is how the system works, how you go into phase two. Just touch the ideogram. How does it feel? As if you're touching the target through space time, you're reaching through space time and touching the target. How does it literally feel? What are the impressions? Hard, soft, wet, dry. It's that easy. Uh, and I'll be walking you through this so you don't have to uh, memorize this. And I, I can put the link to this. Uh, I think I can drop this into the chat if you want to you know, take this with you. And then you describe some sensor information and then some dimensional information, you know, shapes and sizes and patterns. You do a little sketch. And this is how Greg Kolodzic did it. He just did these quick two, three-minute sessions you know, 5,000 of them over 13 years, but they weren't, more, weren't any more complicated than this. And his results are as good as anyone's I've ever seen. Or his ARV experiment with uh, financial markets and stuff. Uh, he ended up making, he said, about $150,000 over 13 years, which he didn't think was very much. He said you'd make more doing other things, but it just proved that it worked. So in any case, you just get your sensory information, you draw your little sketch, just whatever is in your mind's eye. Just draw it and just describe a couple words what you got, and then we'll get the feedback. That's it. It's not harder than that. Now, the only rule here, as I described, you have to describe everything you're getting during the session. So if you're getting something that clearly to you feels like noise, and this is a process of separating signal from noise. If you get something to you feels a little too 3D, a little too colorful, that goes off to the side of the page, on the right side of the page. We call it an uh, analytical overlay, AML, or just an A with a dash. And the reason you do that is the RV signal, like you know, when you get real intuitive information about family and friends, like my mom got the other night to check her bank account for good reason. Um, it's subtle. The noise is actually more 3D. So what we learn to do in RV is to trust uh, the subtle feeling, the subtle voice. It's the opposite of all our educational training that we've all received, which is to pay attention to the loud speaking voice. In RV, you pay attention to something else and it's different for everyone, but it's a very subtle, subtle feeling. If it's too technicolor and loud, that's probably noise. The RV signal is always a uh, weak, uh, fleeting, transient, but very accurate. And so the skill in learning RV is to learn to pay attention to that very quiet voice. 
inside you that shows you aspects of the target. That's what RV training is. It's not actually to, to learn how to RV. We all already know how to do that because we all have an intuition and gut feelings from things from, that we can't verify. We meet people or in situations, we just get gut feelings that we can trust them, right? Or we can't. What is that? You know, it's another type of sense with your gut. They Actually, there's a name for it, the second brain. It's like the uh, digestive system, the uh, gastrointestinal tract has it's a lot of neurons in there because digestion is so critical for our survival. So it, there's a brain in your gut. And that's really what gut feelings are. It's real. So uh, what RV is learning to do is separate signal from noise. And that's your only task when you're doing this. But it's to write everything down. Okay. So get out your pen and paper. And we're going to do some sessions here to just get a feel what RV is like. I think we're all ready. Okay. So this is our first target. Uh, target one. I'll guide you through it. You can use these coordinates if you want. <clears throat> so just write down target one. You can put these coordinates on the page when you're ready and let your hand just do a little ideogram, a, squ a squiggle. Just let it move around the page a little bit. So target one, these are the coordinates, six, five, four, eight. Three eight seven four. Now I will say these are all, you know, ordinary targets from Earth. There are no UFOs in here or anything like that. This is just Earth type targets. And the coordinates for this target are six five four eight three eight seven four. And then draw your ideogram. And then when your hand moves off the page, your ideogram's done. Decode your ideogram a bit. Touch it. Uh, how does it feel when you touch it? Literally, when you touch your ear with your pen or trace it with your pen, does it feel hard? Does it feel soft? Do you, does it feel wet or dry or smooth or rough or any other basic descriptor that you get? And then go ahead and touch it and trace it again and see if you can get a little more information. How does it feel when you touch it? As if you're touching the target in, uh, in, in reality, through space-time. Okay, and now um, touch your ideogram again and see if you can get some colors. Any colors that you perceive is if you're at the target site. Uh, sounds. Temperatures. These are sensory, basic sensory. Smells, tastes. Something we call ambience, sort of the tone of the place. How does it sort of... Uh, feel happy or sad that sort of ambience again temperatures uh smells sounds just write down whatever comes to your mind if you get too much of a 3d image of something that's too wordy too complex that goes off to the right side of the page as noise the noise can be accurate but at this stage you don't know so you put it off to the side you just want the lowest level data here. Okay, so you've gotten some sensories. How about some dimensionals and magnitudes? Uh, size, shape. Patterns. Mass, density, uh, 
volume. Vibrationals, energetics, patterns, shapes, direction, velocity, and then in your imagination, See if you can move back 100 feet in your mind's eye. Move back 100 feet from the target and describe shapes, patterns from 100 feet away. This is called a movement exercise. Pattern, shapes, colors, temperatures. And if the target makes you feel a certain way, in your body, you can you can write that down too. We call that a viewer impression. You just put a VI dash on the right side of the page. It's kind of like noise a little bit, but it's also related to the target. It's how you would feel if you were actually at the target site. How would it make you feel? Okay, and when you're ready, after you have some sensories and dimensions, can you draw a little sketch? This would be phase three in the CRV system, but in the EMU system, you don't have to call it a phase. You could just move down the page a little bit. Can you sketch what you're seeing in your mind's eye about this target? Is let your hand move around the page, basically. Remember, you don't have to name the target. This is... Uh, right brain stuff you're just describing left brain is naming but we're not trying to do that here you're just trying to describe and that's what you're doing in your sketch sort of the shapes and patterns whatever aspect of it you're seeing And in your imagination, move another 50 feet away from wherever you are, 50 feet away from the target and describe what you perceive. And when you're ready, you could end the session and put what the end time, what time is it, wherever you are, end time. And can you look back, first of all, is there anything that you perceived that you didn't write down yet? Write that down. Uh, the reason I say that is sometimes the best stuff is stuff that it's hard to verbalize. So if you're perceiving anything you haven't written down yet, write that down, end the session. And can you do a one or two sentence summary? Can you describe what you got? Oh, just a color, a shape. You don't have to name it. This isn't about naming. It's just about describing a shape, a color, a feeling. And then we'll look at the target picture. How about that? So this is, you've ended the session. You've written the time down. And now this is, a short post-session summary. You look back what you wrote, what feels the most correct, which colors or shapes or sounds or anything that you wrote anywhere. Does any of it feel like this is kind of gut feeling? What feels the most correct? Right, just write a sentence about it. I, at the target side, I perceived this color or this sound or it made me feel this way. Um, I felt like I was indoors, outdoors, whatever.
Okay. Is everyone ready to get their feedback? For some yep. of you, it might be the first RV session. So congratulations. Here is the target feedback. Did anyone get something pointy and sticking up or uh, structure? There are some fountains down there you can see. What was that, Susan? I got the middle of the Eiffel Tower. Middle of the Eiffel Tower. No, like, yeah, like, you know, it's, you know, it's standing on those legs. That part right there I got, yeah. I got the gray skies. And I said there was maybe flowing water in front. Is there? I've never been to France, so. Yeah, it's right here in the picture. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yes, there's a whole row, rows of fountains right in front of it. And, uh, yeah. interesting. Anyone else? Water in there. Uh, it's in the front. It's right in the front. Those are fountains. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I don't know why I got through. <laughs> Have you ever been to France? Yes, I've been there. Okay, would you like to, anyone else want to share? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something that you, I'll tell you something. Every session is a good session if you learn something about yourself. Uh, even sessions you miss, you can learn more than the ones that are perfect. I showed you perfect ones in this presentation, but you learn more from the ones where you don't get it. But it's just, um, it's just a type of practice and it just shows you something else is going on there that, you know, your conscious mind's not aware of. Okay, would you like to try another one? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so target number two. You can write the time for target number two. And here are the coordinates. I'll read you the coordinates. And uh, before I do, just remember, you're, you can let go of the previous target because we're viewing a different target. Now, normally, in the interest of time, we're putting them together. Normally, you would take a five, 10 minute break between targets, but it's a little long uh, in this setting. So we'll just continue, just, just for fun. We'll just continue on. Uh, target number two, the coordinates are seven, three, eight, five, five, seven, four, four, seven, three, eight, five. Five seven four four, and go ahead and let your hand move. And draw your ideogram, your squiggle, your personal hieroglyphics. It just means something to you. It doesn't have to look like anything, <clears throat> but it's a there's a vibe there's a vibe to each ideogram. So touch your ideogram. How does it feel when you touch it? Hard, soft, wet, dry, mushy, smooth. What, what, what does it feel like when you touch it? Moving, not moving. And then uh, touch your ideogram again. See if you can get another descriptor.
And then uh, see, see if we can get some sense, sensory information, uh, colors. Sounds, textures, temperatures, smells, tastes. Ambiance. And some patterns. Shape, size, orientation. Verticals, diagonals, patterns. Space, volume, mass, density, direction, velocity, vibrationals or energetics, Colors, sounds, now in your imagination, move 200 feet over the target area and describe, move 200 feet over the target area and describe. Viewer impression. Are you back? Hey. Oh, sorry, battery dead. Let me see. Okay. Go ahead and draw a sketch. Remember, this was designed to work under battlefield conditions. So it doesn't matter what goes wrong, it'll still work. It really was designed this way, but it's a little slow, isn't it? For yeah. battle. But it's supposed to be really robust. This is so you've gone through your, uh, you moved back, uh, what was it? 50 feet from move, uh, how much move 100 feet over the target and describe? What was it? 200 feet. I forgot the cue. 50 feet. You moved over the target and describe. Uh, do you have a sketch? Would you like to draw a sketch? And does the do you have any feeling from the target? Any viewer impression? Ingo called it aesthetic impact. 
It's just a sign that you're making target contact. You have a feeling that's not coming from your room right now. It's from the target, as if you're getting some perception from it. So go ahead and draw a little sketch. Just let your hand move around. Or look back at the dimensionals you, you described, size, shape. Go ahead and sketch that. Okay. Is there anything you're perceiving that you haven't written down yet? Go ahead and write that down. And the more surprising the information, the more likely it is to be accurate. So I'll ask you this. Is there anything that you perceive at the target site that you find surprising? Write it down. And end your session and do a little summary. So, right, end session. What did you perceive at the target site? The target contains very basic, this is description only, no names. What did you perceive there? Shapes, sizes, colors, uh, patterns. And then we'll get the feedback. Okay, everyone ready to get the feedback on target number two? Yeah. Okay, here it is. Wait a minute. You have to get back to the right window. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. I had something flying. I oh, it's something flying. There you go. I had a train. I think you were hungry. I saw clouds. I saw <laughs> blue the sky. I didn't get no balloons, but I saw something flying. But I right. Because. The naming function is the left brain and, and RV is a right brain sort of thing. So the right brain, so-called bicameral brain, the right brain uh, does more uh, description of what something feels like and what it looks like. The left brain is good at naming, but this, the RV doesn't happen from the left brain. So that's why we can't name it. Yeah, so flying clouds up in the air. <laughs> okay would you like to try one more or is that is that enough questions we, we got to make time now because we got 10 minutes what was that nothing we're ready okay one more yeah. yes we have time to do one more yes okay let's do one more and then any questions that's about two and a half hours i think it's probably Good, but I had I had a whole bunch of targets there, but you, I'll give you information how to do more of these. So, 
Uh, let's do the next target, folks. So just take a cool down for a second. Empty out the two previous targets, let go of them. Okay, so this is target three. When you're ready, you can write down these coordinates. 2519-3281. And let your hand draw a squiggle ideogram. So let your hand move. And when your hand leaves the page, your ideogram's done. And now trace your ideogram or touch it with your finger. What sort of feelings do you get from the target physically? Hard, soft, wet, dry, wet, mushy, smooth, rough. Any of those feel appropriate? And go ahead and probe the ideogram or touch it. Uh, what sensory information do you get? Sounds. Colors. Temperatures. Smells. Tastes. Ambience. Sounds. And in your mind, mentally touch the target. Mentally touch the target. Smells. Sounds. Patterns. Colors. Shapes. Size. Quantity, direction, energetics, shapes, patterns, colors, mass, density. Now, in your imagination, move forward five minutes in time and describe. 
move forward five minutes in time and describe colors, sounds, patterns, direction. And is there anything you're perceiving that you haven't written down yet? Go ahead and write that down. And now, uh, how does the target make you feel, the so-called aesthetic impact, or we just call it a viewer impression? What's the impression it makes on you, the feeling? as if you were there, any any of your impression? That goes off to the right side of the page. And any 3D images, Technicolor, that goes off on the right side of the page too, and let it go. Now, go ahead and draw a sketch. Sketch the target. What do you see in your imagination? Or I should say, what do you see in your mind's eye? Or just look back at what you wrote and let your hand move around. The sketch is actually like a two-dimensional ideogram. So you could just let your hand move. You don't have to visually see anything, but some people who are artistic do, and that's how you get some of those really good drawings. Okay, and when you feel like you're ready, you can end your session. Note the time. And write a little summary. What did you perceive at the target site? And it's really basic. It's colors, shapes, I heard a sound, temperatures. And, you know, what did you feel in there? What did it make you think of? Uh, that's also okay. How did it make you feel? Okay. Everyone ready to get the feedback? Well said. Yes? Yep. Yep. Okay, let's take a look. Oh. Oh. Did anybody get water or animals moving around? People? Water. You got water? I got the shape. shapes. Yeah, the shapes? Now, uh, to practice on your own with this, if this is fun, you can just have friends put pictures and folders and Tell them, you know, tell, they tell you when you're ready and you just describe them like this. Um, That's cool. Uh, any questions? How do you get better at this? Well, it's a question of filtering out noise and it's a signal from noise issue and it just takes practice like anything else. We all have this capacity to some degree or another. For some people, it's a little more apparent than others. But we all have the ability that we're sort of meant to have. So whatever you have, you can work with. Uh, there are people like Bevy Yeagers who had no ability that just trained a lot and got very good. So it's just a question of practicing like anything else. Now, if I have a website. I even have a free course in this that goes through this instruction again and has a practice target. And that's at virtualviewing.org, virtualviewing.org. And uh, 
you can see that there's a link there for the free mini class if you want to do a little more practice in this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are organizations like IRVA that um, have meetings like I described coming up in August and have targets occasionally. And if you do your research, there are different groups out there. Um, even there are even people on Twitter that post targets here and there. So there's different ways to practice. The main thing is just keep it fun. I think this should always be fun. You don't want to push it too hard because nature sort of gave you what capacities you have and you can grow them and train them. Uh, but it should be done, you know, in a natural way, in a way that uh, doesn't interfere with the rest of your life. And we all use this, I think, intuitively from time to time when it matters. Um, and uh, the stronger the need, the more this pops up. Dale Graff described a couple and he was, uh, ran the DIA program on the East Coast for a while. And he gave us examples a couple of times from uh, when he was con doing canoeing up in Canada, remote locations where there were emergencies or something. And he just got these feelings. And as a remote viewer, he yeah. trusted it. Now, Dale does dream viewing. He assigns himself a target before he goes to sleep and describes uh, what he gets during his dreams. It's another way to do it. He thinks it's easier because you're asleep and your conscious mind's not integrating. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I just brought him over. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was yeah. wonderful. I wish we had more time. All right, you guys have to get out of there because it's nine where you are, right? So you I know that they lock us in. One of my challenges. Okay, guys. Well, thanks. Uh, and I have a YouTube channel. Feel free to stay in touch. And uh, just uh, this is a lot of fun. And we'll we'll talk to you again. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Night, guys. Take care for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.